Today we're looking at verse 18 in particular. And I want to talk of God's righteous wrath in a fallen world. Now, one of the chief God-given reasons for government is the prosecution of justice. It's to bring righteousness into a sinful world. It's done by the police, it's done by the magistrates in criminal matters with inside our community, it's done by the defence force in the outside of our community. It's a concern for the safety of our citizens and the protection of humanity. The aim is to bring righteousness to a situation, to prevent evil reigning and to punish evildoers, to protect honest citizens. It's the God-given responsibility for God chooses human governments to restrain evil and to punish evildoers and to maintain justice in his world. You'll find it in Romans 13, which we'll come to one day, God willing. But bringing righteousness into a fallen world involves costly action. It's never finished, for human sinfulness is universal and permanent. It's a permanent part of our existence, so it's never as if government will ever finish the job and bring righteousness into the world. Justice doesn't come by persuasion and reasonableness alone, for evil distorts the reasonableness of people. And that is why the police force wear arms, and that's why the defence force wears arms, and that's why the Courts are always busy and prisons are always full. Bringing righteousness always involves the force of arms. And that's costly. Not just economically costly in the money we spend on our courts and police and defence forces, but also far greater costly in the injury and death to our own service personnel, but also to others in the community and overseas. Taking action to bring justice is a very costly business. And so our actions must be motivated by just anger. The motivation must always be concerned for righteousness and justice. The reason for action can never be gain, conquest. That will never be justified. It has to do with righteousness and justice. God's motivation for his justice is always his anger or his wrath. Now his anger and his wrath are not like ours. Our anger and wrath are temperamental. His are slow and patient. Ours are personal and self. His are concerned for righteousness. Our anger is often out of control, driven by frustration and selfishness. It's rarely just or rarely righteous. The anger of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. But there are times when, when we hear of brutal pack rape or read of the horrors of governmental torture and that we, even we, can develop the righteous anger of God. We can read of what some monsters do to some poor innocent victims and say, that is wrong. That should not be allowed. And it's not just we're being temperamental. It's not we're being frustrated. We're saying pedophilia is evil and it should not be allowed. Little children should not suffer at the hands of adults like that. It's wrong and we can see it's wrong. And it makes us angry that it is in this world. And that anger is a righteous anger, a just anger. In fact, not to be angry when we hear of some inhuman treatment 
is itself to be morally corrupt. If you can hear of barbaric torture of little children and say, oh, well, you know, it's quite interesting. I watched the rugby league on Sunday and it was much the same. Shows that you yourself are as morally corrupt as those who perform such evil deeds. Anger is righteous. However, as the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk saw, there is a problem with God exercising justice through governments and nations. The problem is that all nations are themselves corrupt. So the very nations that punish other are as evil as the nations that they punish. Uh, was Stalin any more righteous than Hitler? That Stalin should defeat Hitler? I mean, they are both evil, or were both evil men, doing monstrous and evil things to their peoples. And why did God raise them up in the first place? And so the prophet Habakkuk says that the righteous, they live by faith in God. They trust that God will in the end bring real justice to the world himself. They depend upon God to do the work of bringing justice. They rely upon God for vindication, even in the midst of a fallen world with unjust justice all around about them. They look beyond the unjust justice of this world to God, who will ultimately bring true justice. And that's the quote at the end of verse 17 here in Romans chapter 1. For as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And he goes on to explain it by saying in verse 18, For because the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For how God's righteousness comes in the world is through God's wrath and justice upon sinfulness. And so today we hear in verse 18 of the wrath of God. That is the wrath of God today in the world, 21st century now. For notice it says the wrath of God in verse 18 is revealed, not was revealed, not is going to be revealed, but is now revealed. For the text is talking of that wrath that will be revealed, not just on the last day, but the present wrath of God that is being revealed now from heaven in this world. The wrath of God that can be seen already at work in the world in which we live. For God has shown forth his wrath by his actions now. But where? Where do you see the wrath of God? How can you see the wrath of God at work in the world today? Well, it's being revealed against men. That is against the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, we're told in verse 18. It's not being revealed against men without cause, but because of our ungodliness and unrighteousness that it is being revealed. God is at work in the world today in a way that shows forth his righteous anger, not in some kind of temperamental peak, but in ways that will bring righteousness and justice to the world in punishing evildoers and preventing them from having their way. And the unrighteousness is further explained in verse 18 as those who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Notice in this verse, there is a rejection of the enlightenment ideal of the modern world that man guided solely by the reasoning and the light of reason would be able to discover and create the good life in this world. The Bible says no way. All people are sinful and our sinfulness it affects our thinking and affects our mind. There is a real interplay between morality and truth. Enlightenment thinkers, modern atheists, never want to see this connection. They want to deny that there is a connection between morality and truth. You can be completely immoral and decadent and still believe in truth, but the Bible says, no, your immorality will distort the truth. 
You will suppress the truth. You will reject the truth because you are immoral. The unrighteous, he says, suppress the truth. By their very unrighteousness, they restrain and hold back the truth. Here at this point, the Bible sounds a little bit more postmodern than modern. It's actually kind of giving you the idea that truth is really a shimmer. It's a, it's a plaything of human rationalization and power games. And there is great truth in postmodernity. You know, Christians are not moderns and we're not postmoderns, we're actually pre-moderns. It's all right to be pre-modern, don't worry about it. Modernity in the 18th century enlightenment took the world off into a theological, philosophical dead end that was wrong. And the post-moderns in the late 20th century started to see what was wrong with modernity. And much of their critique of modernity, Christians have been saying for 200 years. That the way in which people argue with their minds is more an expression of their sinful hearts than the reality of truth. But of course, the postmoderns go the whole hog and say, there is no truth. So it's just playing with your games in your mind. You know, one person thinks it's this, another person thinks it's that. that. That's all right, there is no truth. Whereas Christians say, no, there is a truth. The modern, I will find truth just by the cleverness of my own mind, is wrong because he's immoral. The postmodern, there is no truth, so make up whatever you want, is wrong because he's immoral. They both in their own way suppress the truth out of their sinfulness. But take on board the point that because of unrighteousness, we don't want the truth. We can't bear the truth. We cover up. That's the normal attitude to truth. We censor. We avoid the truth because we are in the wrong and being confronted with wrong is too painful. But what is the truth that we suppress? Verse 19 and 20 make it clear. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. All peoples know of God. Not because people are clever, but because God has made himself known made himself known by his creation. Not that you can know much about him. You only know that he exists and that he is powerful and that he has created all things. It's interesting how true this description is of human knowledge. Atheists are very, very rare creatures in the history of mankind. Even now in a country like Australia, atheists are less than 10% of the population. But across the world, as you come to new and in different groups of peoples, atheists are rare. Most peoples of the world believe in God. And when you ask them why they believe in God, it's because of creation. Recently, the famous atheist of the 20th century, Anthony Flew, has changed his mind. A very famous atheist, Anthony Flew, he wrote books against belief in God in the 20th century, but he has now changed his mind. And he has produced a book, which has got a funny title, especially designed for Australians, because the picture is upside down, because I presume it's to be read down under. But there it is, there is no God has now been changed into there is a God. One of the most famous atheists of the 20th century in the 21st century has come to believe in a God. He's still not Christian. He's still not sure that it is the Christian God, but if there is to be one, that's the one he would believe in. But he still hasn't come to a full Christian conclusion, but he has come to the conclusion that there is God. And why? Because of creation. The evidence of this world is overwhelming. It is more believable that God made it than that it is an accident. Humanity's religion is not a search for God, but it's a futile attempt to run away from God. All the pursuit of gods and religions and idols and spirituality, that's not seeking God, that's turning your back on the God who has revealed himself in creation. It's the exact reverse of what most people think. For what can be known about God is plain to people, 
but they would rather turn to other gods and to statues and to idols and to, to animals. And therefore, three times we read that God in his anger, therefore, gives people up. Chapter 1, verse 24, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, dishonouring of their bodies amongst themselves. Verse 26, For this reason God gave them up to dishonourable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations with those contrary to nature. And verse 28, And since they didn't see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Here is the wrath of God revealed from heaven to us. Notice the justice of his wrath. They want to live life without God. And so God gives them up to live life without him. The punishment fits the crime perfectly. They get exactly, precisely what they asked for. But out of my life, I'm going to run my own life my own way. And so God says, well, off you go. He gives them up to their own disastrous choice of life. And that's where we see the wrath of God in the fallenness of the world. When you see the corruption of Sydney, you're not just seeing the sin of Sydney, you're also seeing the wrath of God upon sinful city. Habakkuk was taught that in the destruction of Judah by the Babylonians, God was handing over the people. He was giving up the people to the destruction of their life. And he also was told that when the Babylonians, the godless Babylonians came in their conquest, they too would be given up by God and in time be conquered. So where do we see the wrath of God today? Well, you just go out into the streets of Sydney. And you can see the wrath of God if you know what the Bible teaches you to see. You see it in the sensual hedonistic materialism that rules our city. You see it in the materialistic greed that makes house prices the main subject for barbecue discussions. You see it in the materialistic greed of our banking systems, or especially the American banking system, which has brought the whole world to teeter on economic recession. On, on terrible depression that may come even yet. You see it in the decadence of our entertainment industry and the shameless flaunting of our sexual immorality. There you see the wrath of God. It's not just the sin of man that you see, but you see the wrath of God because God has not intervened and stopped us from being sinful. God has given us over to our own sinfulness. For instead of coming to rescue us from our folly, he leaves us to wallow in the mud of our own choosing. He leaves us to our own hurt and pains. And so, what is our society like under the wrath of God? Well, it's there for us in verse 29. They are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetous, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. There is the wrath of God. The world gone amuck is the wrath of God. But that's not the end of God's wrath. That's where the wrath of God is at the moment. But there is also coming the day of God's wrath. There is a day which is called the day of wrath, mentioned over in chapter 2, verse 5. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Or again down verse 16, it speaks of it. On the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men's hearts by Christ Jesus. For God has fixed a day at the end of the world. God has fixed a day in which he will bring his wrath in justice and judgment upon the whole world. There is the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be finally revealed. And on that day... And not until that day, but on that day, each of us will receive what we deserve. Verse 6, he will render to each one according to his works. At the moment, you see, the whole world has been given up to our sinfulness. And so some people suffer considerably more than other people in an unrighteous and fallen world. But on that last day, 
Everyone will receive exactly what everyone deserves. But in the meantime, God's patient wait is abused by people. For instead of using the time to get right with God, instead of using the time to seek and to serve him, instead of using the time to repent and turn back to God, people think that by their high moral principles, by the fact that they're no worse than their neighbour, by the fact that they're better than their neighbour, by the fact that they've got away with it so far, people think that they are able to avoid the wrath of God. Look at chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day? Friends, this is so often the case. People in our society never imagine that they will come under the wrath of God. They'll be critical of materialism while being greedy. They'll be critical of mindless hedonism while pursuing happiness and pleasure. People never assume, they never imagine that they will come under God's wrath for they do not see the wrath of God in the troubles around about them. If you were to suggest that the coming recession and depression is the wrath of God on Western materialism, they, they write you off as a lunatic. What a strange, weird thing. It's got nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with God. He is showing us that our system doesn't work, that our world is sinful and corrupt. That's what he's doing. But people will not see the hand of God and the wrath of God, and they will not see that he is patiently waiting and waiting and waiting for us to repent. For God, in his part, is patient, patiently waiting for the day when true justice will finally come, the day that we want when everything will finally be put to right. For that day, we're not prepared. God is patiently, kindly giving us time to repent. More of that next week when we look under the kindness of God. But God's wrath is not being met by our repentance. Our society is warned over and over and over by God. One disaster after another happens to us. He sends floods, he sends fires, he sends tsunamis, he sends depressions, he sends wars, he sends divorce. And we keep saying, no, no, couldn't happen to me, couldn't happen to me. No, no, yeah, everything's right with the world. I live in well. This is a great world and all's okay. But let's return to the text of Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is mentioned there as an explanation of the righteousness of God that is in the world today. For, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungod uh, ungodliness and the righteousness of men who suppress the truth. We're told in verse 17 that in the gospel we have the righteousness of God, the justice of God revealed already. That is, today you can see the wrath of God in this world if you understand from the scriptures what you're looking at out there. You know, the world is like looking down a microscope. You look down the microscope and there's this blob and all kinds of little wriggly things inside it. And you need somebody to come along beside you and explain what they are. Once you had them explain to you what they are, you say, oh, now I see what these are. Well, you walk out into the society, you walk out into our streets of this city, and there's all these people going around doing all kinds of things. And the Bible comes beside you and says, yeah, that's the wrath of God. That's why it's not working. That's why it'll never work. That's why it will always need courts. We will always need police. We will always need judges and magistrates and, and defence forces because the world does not work because God has given it up to sinful people like you and me to run. You see the wrath of God, but so too you can see today the righteousness of God. For we are waiting for the righteous God judgment of God when the wrath of God will be finally revealed. But in the gospel, we already can see the power of God to save. 
And this is God's way. It may not be the way we would choose. It may not be the way we would expect God to choose. But then our thoughts are contaminated by sin. It's not surprising we don't think God's way. But this is God's way to save people and to bring righteousness into the world. It's by the declaration of the Lordship of Jesus Christ that he died and rose again and sits at God's right hand in all power and authority. This is God's way to bring righteousness now. God's way to save his people now. It's the message of the victory of God's Son. His appointment as Lord of heaven and earth. His appointment of the judge to be the judge of the living and the dead. This message is the power of God to save people. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. For in it the payment for sin in the death on the cross has already happened. And the establishment of the righteous one, Jesus Christ, has already happened. For now there is a new deal for those who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who trust God's word, who rely upon the death and resurrection of Jesus. For now there is the declaration that we are standing right with the judge of all the world. Now, not because of our good deeds, not because God has lowered his standards to let us in, not because of our religiosity or our morality or our spirituality, not because of our wisdom, but because Jesus has paid the penalty for us, we are already right with God. And because of the death and resurrection of God's Son, there on the cross, the one righteous man bore the wrath for many. For their sake and for all our sake, all who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. So you see the wrath of God in several places in the world around about us. On the last day when Jesus returns. But on that day in Calvary 2,000 years ago, when the Son of God bore the wrath of his Father for all who believe in him. There also you see the righteous, just wrath of God. And if you have your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Though you still live in this sinful, wrath-filled world, and though you will one day come to that day of judgment, yet you will also now already be right with God.